Good evening and thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Heather Crawford and I'm Anthony Austin. We are following results for more than 100 races and you're going to find those scrolling at the bottom of your screen. We also have results on our First Coast News app and our website right now. In fact, you can text us the keyword results to 904-633-2402 and we'll send it to your phone right now. We want to start tonight with the race for Jacksonville Sheriff. And that was an early call tonight for Republican TK Waters, who's now set to take over the sheriff's office for at least the next few months. And he won with nearly 55% of the votes compared to Lakeisha Burden's 45%. On your sides, Zach Wilcox is at TK Waters watch party tonight. Yeah, Anthony, it's uh, all quiet here now, but it was anything but just a couple of hours ago when they announced that TK had won the race for sheriff and he was all smiles as he worked his way up to the stage to give his acceptance speech. Talked about how Jacksonville is such a great city. It's his favorite city and that he won't will not rest until everyone can live here safely. And he actually got a little emotional during his speech talking about his son, Tommy. He dedicated the win to Tommy talking about how uh, Tommy told him when he was first promoted to assistant chief that he was going to make a great sheriff one day and TK you know thought that that was a ways out in the making but here we are and it's been 31 years in the making and despite all of that experience getting to this point it's actually just a short term that uh, Waters will be serving at least initially here only six months so that's why when I got a second with him I asked him what can he really accomplish in in just the next six months. We're going to work on delivering, uh, re, re, remapping our zones and where our manpower goes. I think that's very important. It hasn't been done in many, many years. And I think that's a very, very important thing for us to do. Logistically and how we put our people and where we, where we assign is very important. And let's just take a quick look at the timeline here because it is fast. We're going to have two weeks here until TK is sworn in. Until then, Pat Ivey will remain sheriff. Then he will serve until July. However, there is another election in March, and he told me he will be back on that ballot. That will be for a full term when he will be running for re-election at that point. In San Marcos, Zach Wilcox, First Coast News, on your side. Thank you, Zach. And Waters, a challenger, Lakeisha Burden, told her supporters she will stay involved and she felt inspired by the people she met during her campaign. All your size, Destiny McKeever, was at her campaign event earlier tonight. Well, Lakeisha Burton made her speech tonight on that stage at around 8 o'clock. She talked about two big things. She talked about what's next for her, if anything, and she and also talked about what she did as soon as she found out TK Waters won the sheriff's race. Burton says she doesn't know what's next. She says she will go home and get rest before deciding what's next. And she also says she congratulated TK Waters on his win tonight and told him she would be there to help him however needed. Lakeisha Burton is no stranger to law enforcement, having served 24 years at JSO. She was once a zone commander and an assistant chief. Her campaign was run on change with a focus on Jacksonville's crime rate. Well, tonight she says she will continue bringing people together as she believes Jacksonville is politically divided. What happened with my candidacy, it brought people together from diverse communities, and I think that is um, representative of, you know, all of us at our core wanting the same thing. We want a safe community, you know, so I I'm just excited. Lakeisha Burton making that speech at about 8 o'clock tonight. She did not again say whether or not she will be running again for that race that's coming up in March. Of course, we'll keep you updated with the very latest reporting from the South Bank. I'm Destiny McKeever, First Coast News on your side. And we want to take a moment now and uh, dive deeper into the Jacksonville Sheriff's race. That's right. Let's send it over to Jeannie Blaylock, who's with our analysts tonight. Jeannie. Well, let's start with John Dale. He's a professor of political science at UNF, and this is a very interesting question. Who ran the most TV ads in the Sheriff's race in Jacksonville? And do you think that mattered? Well, I, I do think it matters. That's one of the things I teach at UNF. And I think there was a big disparity. Their fundraising was actually a lot closer than the disparity in, in the amount of ads they ran. And I think TK ran a much more traditional race where he had, he outspent uh, Burton five to one on local TV in terms of political ads. And let's talk now to Obi Umana, an attorney and political consultant. Now, Obi, Burton loses by 10 percentage points. And as we've been hearing, there's another election in March and that will decide who's the sheriff for the next four years. Do you think that with this 10% gap, 
that Burton should run again. Well, listen, uh, Chief Burton did a lot of things that you've, you haven't seen from a Democratic candidate running uh, citywide. A, she raised a good amount of money. B, she was able to pull from both sides of the aisle. And to be honest, she ran up against a red wave, right? And, and that affected the turnout for her. So she definitely should be back in the running if she decides to run, to, to run again. She's the, she was the, 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 definitely the best candidate in the primary on the Democratic side. So she shouldn't be so discouraged about what happened today. All right, we appreciate you too. We'll talk to you again in a few minutes. Back over to you all. Thank you so much. Now to the top two race, two, two of the top races that we've been watching across the nation. The first, the race for governor here in Florida. Governor Ron DeSantis declared the winner as the polls officially closed. Now, Governor DeSantis brought in nearly 60% of the vote against his challenger, former Governor Charlie Chris. Let's head over to On Your Size, Rich Donnelly, who has been in Tampa tonight at the governor's watch party, Governor DeSantis's watch party. Rich? The party continues here in Tampa at the Ron DeSantis victory celebration and during the campaign the governor ran ads saying that he would continue to fight and take on all comers. During his victory speech he continued that theme. We fight the woke in the legislature. We fight the woke in the schools. We fight the woke in the corporations. We will never ever surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke. During a speech that often attacked Democratic lawmakers in Washington, D.C., the governor did take a moment to thank his wife for standing by his side. Being a great wife, giving unwavering support, being a tremendous mother uh, to our three young children, and serving as an example for women throughout this state, especially going through the battle of cancer, she is said that when he first took office, he had a vision for the state of Florida, and he executed that vision. He also says that he plans on having better days ahead. Reporting in Tampa, Rich Donnelly, First Coast News, on your side. And DeSantis's challenger, former Florida Governor Charlie Chris, thanked his supporters during his concession speech tonight, calling the people of Florida, quote, good, decent, and kind. It's been an absolute blessing uh, to serve as your governor before, uh, to serve as the congressman from my hometown. I, I feel like the most blessed man ever. And uh, Governor DeSantis, to you and your family, I wish you only the best. Um, and I wish the best to my fellow Floridians. So there is a lot to unpack with Governor DeSantis's reelection win tonight. So let's head over to our analysts to break it all down for us. Let me tell you something, this race really has our experts talking. I was watching them look at the results going, oh my goodness. Andrew Pantazzi has covered politics for years here. So what comes next for DeSantis? I mean, what would prevent him from announcing that he's running for president? I mean, I think he needs to game out exactly how he's going to handle a potential primary against the former president, Donald Trump. But where he stands right now, winning by a nearly 20-point margin, is really tremendous in a state like Florida. And it puts him on strong footing um, to be able to handle even a tough primary ahead. And when can we expect an announcement from DeSantis? There's really no hurry for him, right? Yeah, I don't think there's a hurry right now, especially given what we saw with the Florida legislature. He's now got super majorities in the Florida House and Senate where he can pass any number of legislation to use to bolster his campaign ahead of time. So, Obi, let's talk about Democrats versus Republicans. If you look back in recent governor's races in Florida, sometimes the winning margin, or you could say losing margin, has been super crazy tight but not tonight. I mean, Chris loses by, what, 19%. So Democrats have got to be thinking, what can, what can they do to fix this? Well, well, clearly, when you have one of the biggest losses by a Democrat in 154 years, you definitely have the wrong person at the top of the ticket. What Democrats need to decide now are they're going to listen to their elite or they're going to listen to the grassroots organizers and people that have told them that Charlie Chris was not that person. Hopefully they they bring in new leadership that will actually listen to their voters so they won't suffer a defeat like they did this th today. So you're saying they need to get more grassroots and get off the elite then, right? Right. They need to do that, but they also need to really sit down and listen to what their voters are asking them to do. I think what sometimes what Demo what these what these Democratic consultants are telling them it's only catering to certain people and not catering to their actual voters. And as you saw today, their voters stayed home. 
and that was not a close election at all for a governor. All right, thank you too. We'll be talking with you all in just a more minute. And uh, let's go back now to Anthony and Heather. Anthony? And Jeannie, let's talk about the other local race for governor in Georgia. So just coming into our newsroom at this late hour, Governor Brian Kemp now projected to win re-election after Stacey Abrams, his Democrat opponent, has just conceded the race to him. As of right now, Kemp has the lead with nearly 54% of the vote over Stacey Abrams, 45%. Now to the race for U.S. Senate in Florida. In another quickly called race, Senator Marco Rubio won his re-election bid with nearly all of the ballots counted. Rubio has nearly 58% of the vote over Val Demings, 41%. And on your side, Taylor Levesque was with the Rubio campaign as the results came down in Senator Rubio's favor. Rubio spoke to hundreds of his supporters with his family by his side here in Miami. He says he's grateful for re-election and to represent the state of Florida. He says his job is to protect the rights of people and that's exactly what he plans to do. The people in this country are going to vote for the people that fight for people like them. They're going to vote for people that are going to fight for people that care about being safe, that don't want drugs coming across our border, that don't want illegal immigration running rampant into our country, that don't want to have to pay $4 for gasoline, that don't want to have to pay 22% more than they used to for their groceries. So when you see the results across this country tonight, that's what it's all about. Rubio went on to say that after tonight, the Republican Party will never be the same, and he is more energized and excited than ever before to work in the U.S. Senate. This will be his third term. In Miami, Taylor Mulbeck, First Coast News, on your side. And Democratic Senate candidate Val Demings spoke to her supporters in Orlando, where she served as former police chief. And although she lost her race to Rubio tonight, she vowed to keep fighting and urged others to do the same for issues important to them. We must look to our next fight to stand for the values we believe in and hold America to its promise of liberty and justice. And this race between Senator Rubio and Val Demings was also a close one being watched across the nation. So let's check back in with our analysts with a closer look at this race. Jeannie. Yeah, let's dig into this just a bit more. So we're talking about Val Demings and her local roots. Wolfson High School, deep roots in Mandarin. Let's look at this graphic right here. This is not statewide numbers. This is Duval County today. She doesn't do well at all, 44.5% to Rubio, 54.2%. So, John, how come? What happened? Well, interesting parallels with, between Demings and Burton, both African-American female Democrat candidates, both Wolfson High grads. Both ended up with about 44% uh, of Duval vote. Uh, I think they both made some strategic mistakes along the ways, but they also both suffered from a weakness at the top of the ticket that did not bring out African-American voters. And so let's talk a little bit, Andrew, about a trend you've been noticing all evening here. Is there a trend of just voting whoop, straight down party lines and not really focusing on the candidate, or what are you seeing? Yeah, I think what we're seeing is more and more people are voting based on party, and so for the first time you're really seeing not much difference no matter what race it is, whether it's the sheriff, the governor, attorney general, CFO, all these races coming in pretty similar and it seems like voters are instead just saying are you a D or are you an R and since Democrats didn't turn out to vote today that means it doesn't matter how good of a candidate you might have been down ballot or for the US Senate because the top of the ticket, the gubernatorial race was not bringing people out to vote people weren't voting. And so even in a place like Jacksonville, where Val Demings has such deep roots, she didn't do much better than Charlie Chris did here. A lot of interesting things happened tonight, but this is midterm, not the presidential election. So we'll see what happens as we go on for the next couple of months. So back yeah. to you guys. Thank you so much for all your expertise tonight. Heather and Anthony. All right, thank you, and now to the race for Senate in Georgia, where at this hour, the race just way too close to call. As of now, it's a split down the middle with both Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock pulling in 49% of the vote. You see those numbers here between us. At last check, less than 30,000 votes separate the two. We're also keeping a close eye on this race throughout the night. And three proposed amendments on Florida's Constitution still up in the air at this hour. Amendment one would allow homeowners to floodproof their homes without being taxed on those improvements. improvements. Amendment two would abolish the state's Constitutional Revision Commission. 
And then Amendment 3 would expand the homestead property exemption for first responders, teachers, and the military. Now, constitutional amendments must receive at least 60% of the vote in order to become law. None is above that threshold at this point. Let's go to St. Johns County. Now, voters there overwhelmingly rejecting a proposed sales tax, that one penny sales tax. The ballot amendment called for an additional 1% sales tax to finance nearly half a billion in county projects, including roads and parks. But 63% of voters said no to the idea, many, ex many expressing concerns that that tax would subsidize developers and allow unchecked growth to continue. St. Johns County is the second fastest growing county in the state. And you can keep track of some of these uh, too close to call races and other local results that we haven't covered on air by going to the First Coast News app and our website, firstcoastnews.com.